And we're now, I would like to welcome everybody to the April meeting of the Ventura County Potter's Guild. Uh, we're a guild of local ceramic artists um, who are dedicated to advancing the art of ceramics um, through education and community, both within our guild and out in the communities which in we live with, within which we live and work. And every month we have the fourth Monday, we have a program and I'm going to turn this over to Janet Newwalder, who will introduce our guests for today, who have, I believe, stayed awake from the East Coast <laughs> to, to help us to, to enlighten us about their work and their life in pottery. Janet? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, everyone? That's, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. And I am so excited about this program because I have known Polly Ann and Frank Martin since 1982. And I was so lucky that our paths crossed at the Kansas City Art Institute where they did their BFA. And we studied with Ken Ferguson, Victor Babu, and George Timok, and also had visiting artists like uh, Clary Illion there. Um, just amazing. And then we all earned our MFAs at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, where we studied with Graham Marks and had Mark Ferris um, for a wonderful uh, visiting artist uh, residency that he did there. In fact, we took him sledding and he broke ribs. So Graham was very mad at us um, on that. I'll try to make the introduction very brief. They're, they have a wonderful program and they are welcoming questions. So um, um, I'll tell you how to address, get, put the questions in the chat. But um, so they both received their uh, schooling together and at, um, in Kansas City and Cranbrook. And I guess I'll just start with Polly Ann here. Um, currently, she is, uh, they're living in Maryville, Tennessee, where they both have a studio um, that they've built and they're raising their children there as well. Um, and currently, uh, Polly Ann's adjunct professor at Maryville College and also the studio manager at Camp Blackberry in Wallen, Tennessee. And it's a, got a wonderful program there that they're going to introduce us to. Also, for uh, 10 years, they both taught at the summer program at the Chautauqua Institute in upstate New York, a really unique community. Also taught at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, Greenwich House Pottery. Um, for four years, they were the co-department uh, co heads at the Worcester Center for the Crafts in Massachusetts. They also taught at the RISD summer programs. These just go on and on. Um, Polly Ann also has authored a variety of writings and in books and catalogs. And she's in the permanent collections at Amica in Pomona and the Vatican Museum in Rome, which I didn't know, and the Kansas City Study Collection. And her work's featured often in exhibitions such as Strictly Functional and the Ensica Annuals and Baltimore Clayworks and Quabic Pottery. And there's more to tell, but um, you can Google her at the end of the presentation. And Frank recently retired as a professor emeritus from the University of Tennessee School of Art, where I think he might've been there 25 years, but it, a, lo a long time. And um, actually he's still, um, the head or facilitating the clay club very very actively so he's still connected he's also been the recipient of the tennessee uh, fellowship artist commission and he too is such a long list of exhibits but just you know some of the um well known the american pottery festival that at the northern clay center um and he's in numerous collections as well, the Dinnerware Museum in Ann Arbor, the Wesson Museum of Fine Art in Wisconsin, the Crocker Museum up in Sacramento, and the Alfred Museum, and is published in a variety of books. Probably some of you have seen his work in 500 Platters and Chargers and the Best of 500 Ceramics Vases, so um, as well as Macon Clay. So I will let them 
present their presentation and if you have questions they will welcome them but perhaps put them in the chat um, the group chat I'm going to just jot them down because in the event there's many and then I'll just um, we'll have time at the end to uh, have a conversation so it's my pleasure to invite Frank and Polly Ann to the guild thank you so much Thank you, Janet. Um, Thank you. Um, we just wanted to say uh, it's been really a pleasure putting this presentation together. Um, we've certainly done a lot of different talks um, separately together in an evening, but um, this really did afford us an opportunity to put something together. Um, we're pretty close to celebrating 39 years together. And um, it's just been really a joy to do this presentation. Yeah. Um, Janet, we wanted to say thank you personally for inviting us. And Foz, it's been really a pleasure getting to know you and having that moment to kind of visit the other day. But we're going to um, have the presentation unfold. I'm going to do um, a bit of introduction in the beginning. Then Frank's going to talk about his work and I'll do mine. And then we'll conclude with some of our sales. Um, you'll get a sense of our path in clay and um, how it has unfolded over time. <clears throat> so there's a bit of reading. I'm sure that the Guild will have something posted permanently and, and it's not necessary that we read everything that we've posted per frame, but essentially um, we have been together for 39 years. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be able to work together uh, share our studio lives, um, have our family, and have uh, work unfold. Um, we did meet in um, 1984, got married. Um, we were at that time at Wichita State. Frank is originally from uh, Oklahoma, and um, his family then moved to Wichita, so we're both from the Midwest. Myself, I'm from um, the Chicago, Illinois area. Frank was an only child, and I came from a very large uh, family of women um, who were extraordinary cooks, and it was destined in some way that I would become a potter um, to make the dishes that everyone uh, served those, dish, those uh, meals in. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Just go ahead. Right go here. ahead. Enter. So this is a very early photograph of us. We've certainly changed through time. Um, but uh, this was right when we began in Kansas City. Uh, Frank's, when we first initially met, um, Frank was at Wichita State and I had just transferred from a couple of different schools. I uh, grew up, as I mentioned, in Chicago. Half of uh, my older siblings were in New York City. And so I started my art path um, at New School for Research at Parsons, and then went to a small uh, state school a little bit south of Oklahoma City, and then transferred to Wichita, which at the time um, was really, really um, one of the better established clay schools that was in the country. Um, and Frank happened to be there, we met, and then uh, there was a play conference called Echoes, um, that we ended up being able to go to that was um, a power hit conference that was in Kansas City. And um, that's kind of how things got launched for us to transfer after we got married into Missouri and then uh, going on to Kansas City. Our education, essentially, um, it really started the whole kind of path and journey for us um, professionally in clay. So Essentially, Wichita State, uh, Rick St. John was there, Don Gauthier was there. Um, there was a lot of support for um, the vessel, for making pots, certainly for sculpture as well. Um, when we transferred to Kansas City Art Institute, um, we went for a few years and um, there was a, a further awakening, especially since the museum, the Nelson Atkins was there. Um, really getting into a lot more um, the history of ceramics. One of the things that I know that Janet could speak to freely as well is 
um, which was not part of um, the programmatic study, but Ken Ferguson, um, one of the professors at the time, was extraordinarily passionate about ceramic history. And he would have this unscheduled, um, uncredit-based free lecture on Friday afternoons um, when it was just the longest part of the week. And you could tell it was about pure passion. And he would just talk on ceramic history for hours. And it was a true gift um, professionally that he had offered anyone that was in undergraduate study at that time. I don't know how many years he did it, but um, I know that um, we were really uh, fortunate to be a part of that uh, path for him as well. And so that really um, was a very, very strong influence. Victor Babu was there at the time, as Janet had mentioned, as well as George Timmock. That's where at that time I met my mentor, Karen Carnes, and I'll address that when I get to, to my work. Um, she was there during the undergraduate years of my junior and senior year, which en ended up enveloping into a, a, a lifelong professional relationship with her. But from there, um, we had decided that our studies were not over after we got our bachelor's. And we decided that we wanted to go and pursue a master's degree. Um, we had been uh, interested in a couple of different programs. From there, um, we were visiting the other day with Foz, and um, you can, any one of us have experienced different education experiences through different colleges, community college, um, state universities, private colleges, et cetera. But for myself, um, I was really interested in going into Cranbrook because Graham Marks was really, really a devotee of the vessel and function. And even though a sculptor, he was um, very, very, and is, there's no past tense about him, but he's very articulate. And um, he really wants to give um, purpose to the things that we make. And he offered that forum for me um, and certainly for Frank at the same time. So we went um, and did our, studies at Cranbrook for a couple of years, both got our master's uh, concentration in ceramics, uh, finished in 89. Um, from there, we went to, um, oh, from there, um, started um, a, a path of an early uh, teaching career. Uh, we were accepted um, as craftsmen in residence at Poabic Pottery just out of grad school but also had our first opportunities to teach. We were teaching at 92nd Street Y the very first summer after we got our master's and um, also at Poabic. Um, and then uh, you'll, I'll address later how our summers uh, were kept. Well, what was really important for us was that if we were to teach that we really did have an active studio and um, that really had to parallel um, our interest in teaching at the time. I have to say, um, in kind of a revisiting a conversation we had on Friday, um, I didn't know exactly that I would want to teach in clay and um, I'm still at it after all these years. So it's been a, a life journey, um, learning and sharing with um, other people who are interested in a variety of mediums. So from uh, Poabic um, and the 92nd Street Y, which really allowed us some adventure in other um, clay mediums. Uh, the, the Y was experimental in changing their clay. So that summer was earthenware. So I got to dive in as well as Frank into a, another clay medium. And then from there, we had learned um, about Wichita, I mean, excuse me, uh, Worcester Center for Crafts in Massachusetts. And then our journey led toward New England. Um, what was interesting about Worcester Center for Crafts was we had gone to um, interview and they had been sitting on, which we did not know, kind of in forward thinking, um, they were sitting on a 10-year want for a renovation for a studio. And when we went for our interview, we dove right into that with both feet. And so our very first year was settled into their existing studio, and then we were giving, given a uh, as I recall, a $50,000 purse to renovate a new studio at the far end of the annexed wing. Um, Norton Ceramics was there. Uh, we were able to get some free kiln shelves, uh, brick, uh, built a wood kiln, um, and uh, piloted what is now their um, um, 
internship artisan residence programs where somebody can come for a year and a worth of study so that they could kind of use that as an independent studies program as well, which is really nice to know that that's still existing. But from Worcester, um, there was an opportunity then uh, to go um, do a interim professorship at UMass Dartmouth. Um, Chris Gustin was taking a year off and Karen Doherty was uh, the uh, associate professor at the time. And we had gotten um, through our interview and invited to come for a year. And it was letting go of our studios and the association with Worcester where we had participated in teaching um, the School for Professional Studies program, which was an intensive program that had a, accreditation through Clark University. But with UMass, it gave us an opportunity to really um, look at that higher level of education again, to have, um, we had 15 um, graduates and there were 60, uh, um, there was 60 overall undergraduates, but 30 with the concentration. So it was a really nice intensive opportunity for us as well. From there, um, our next journey was back to 92nd Street Y. Um, Jeff Cox, um, some of you may have come across him in your uh, past many, many years ago. He was a beloved instructor um, in New York and his health was failing. And so we were asked to step in by Bob Gilson and we ended up staying for half a dozen years. So we lived outside of the city, had a um, our studio in Warwick, New York, and then commuted. I still um, had sisters that were living in the city at the time, still do. Um, and we would commute back and forth and then have our studio. And then um, we did an interim uh, bit of time at SUNY New Paltz in between all of that. So the next frame kind of goes to maybe our compulsive work ethic <laughs> or how busy we were. Um, right after going back to Puavik, um, the one thing that we just didn't want to do and had a desire for, Puavik was a wonderful facility uh, historically, it gave a whole new insight in terms of the development of ceramic from uh, Mary Chase Stratton time from 1904 and forward, um, gave new perspective towards studio potting and then art pottery at the time. But one of the things that we didn't want to do was spend a hot summer uh, in Detroit. And we had looked into some summer programs that some of our friends had gone to um, and Chautauqua was one of them. And so we had interviewed for that and then it ended up directing their program um, for many, many summers um, over the vast number of years. Don Kimes and um, Lois Jubeck had um, directed that program. And again, um, beyond Worcester and renovating that space, the ceramic studio at Chautauqua really needed renovation. And so that was our second kind of introduction to um, being um, stewards of a, a purse of money and then um, trying to do something really responsible to improve another program. And that's been, that was really amazing. Um, as far as Rhode Island and uh, Providence, that was a, a wonderful gift for us as well. We were asked um, to go and teach um, the grads that one of one of the summers, and um, it was a concentrated study for uh, for their graduates, um, and we did that as well. And then once again, we returned back to uh, Chautauqua with our kids much much later in years, and so. Um, they now um, kind of thought of that as their summer, their their summer away from home as well. So that kind of gives you an overall picture of our of our kind of background. Um, in terms of present, um, and again, Janet had mentioned that Frank has just retired. Um, it was in I think 2021 20, years in there in terms of the time period that that he was there. Um, he did get to associate professorship um, and um, did the, the thing about teaching, and I think any one of us that do teach, whether it's for a year in our lives or 30 years in our lives, the amazing thing is that you can still have those relationships with people that you've known for all of the, those years, those um, conversations that you've shared, um, the growth that you've seen, um, those um, fellow students go through who have now become 
um, friends over the years. That's been a, a really lovely thing to kind of see and mature. But I also was, um, when Frank was at UT, I started um, a 13 year jaunt at Maryville College and I expanded on um, my teaching scope. Um, Worcester did that for us as well. We uh, For Maryville College, I was teaching clay, I was teaching sculpture, I was teaching drawing, um, I was teaching figure drawing. Um, and there was something really wonderful about the last class for me, which was um, an art experiential class. So one could take it in all sorts of manners. If you were a music instructor, the concentration was music. Um, I just can't quite take those smaller bites of things. And so I would cover everything from sculpture to painting to clay to music to culinary. And so th that class for me, that was really, really rewarding. And so um, that particular time for Maryville College had come to an end. Um, we had then, um, when we first moved to Maryville 20 plus years ago, um, Frank had gotten a Tennessee grant and then we were able to build on the house. So you'll see in this particular frame that that is um, uh, you know, part of our kiln shed area in there. The other thing about Maryville College, which I'll say, is that once again, it was an opportunity to renovate a studio. So I moved into a, a defunct um, clay shop um, that had not been in function for 20 years, revisited all the old, old equipment from old Italian continental wheels to locker bees to l, &L kilns. It was just an amazing kind of uncovering. Um, got that program going, and then they renovated two more times in my time there, which then led me to the present job that I have now um, at Blackberry Mountain. So right now uh, for me, uh, for Frank himself, he's at home making pots full time. Um, myself, um, I'm dividing my time between the studio and then being at Blackberry Mountain. Those of you may, may know about it, but I'll just give a little bit of a description. Um, in the 70s, the Bell family bought a, a 4,200 acre uh, parcel of earth called Black, and they named it Blackberry Farm. Um, it became known and most um, renowned for its culinary um, um, kind of development over time as a bed and breakfast. And then 25 minutes from Blackberry Farm, they developed another parcel of earth of 5,200 acres, which is where I work, called Blackberry Mountain. And it's also um, a resort. It's a Relais Chateau, um, which is an exclusive type of uh, bed and breakfast, if you will, that also celebrates the culinary arts. So my part in that is that um, I am the studio manager of the art program and the, it's the number one activities of the whole mountain, even though it is a mountain based experience. Um, I'm really proud to say I participated in designing the studio, which is a 360 square foot space. And then in that space, we teach a uh, wheel, hand building tile, do raku, of course, outside. Um, we have now a pavilion for painting acrylic and watercolor. We do sketching and trail side. Uh, basket making, we use flat reed, round reed, and then um, we have in the south, those of you that have visited here, a lot of honeysuckle and a lot of kudzu. Um, and so we started doing uh, natural vine baskets as well. And then our textiles program has grown to thread work. And then we have experiential classes, um, which are meditative for mandala stone, watercolor, and then awaken through clay, which is off those grassroots um, classes that. Um, Mary Caroline uh, Richards and Paulus Berenson would run, which are really, really wonderful classes. And just in terms of that sensorial experience and then having that touch of, of clay as earth and then what that can do medita in, it, in its meditative form. So here, I'm gonna kind of remove myself off to the side a little bit so Frank can introduce his work and then I'll come back in. So I, um recently took uh, early retirement at the University of Tennessee and um, changed, uh, it's a, become a new chapter in what, what I've been doing is, is my creative activity in, in my work. And so the, the work that all through this time at the university has been focused on exhibitions and, and uh, 
putting that work into shows and competitions and and things of that nature and so the the work uh that i've recently been doing has has been focusing on the community and what what the community can can do most of the work that i've done uh in the past that still overlaps is i still think about the the process of what the the useful object does how it's formed uh, what's what's the best way to shape that, and also the glaze formulation, and and how that texture and uh, those that alchemy of of uh, uh, materials that constantly keep changing from your supplier can can affect the outcome of your your work. And so these are kind of some images of of things that that I kind of think about. The different forms when I when I start working on it, I'll go through a number of permutations before I settle on a one way of, of kind of forming that. And the same thing happens with the glazes. The teapot, um, even from graduate school and before graduate school, had had been one of the my what I would consider one of my mainstays because it was a very complex form and it required a, a number of parts starting uh, from one of the images over on the far left and to the most recent on the on your right on the screen. Uh, the, probably the most noted piece would be on the, the lower left-hand corner, which was the a first teapot that I made in mid-range at uh, Chautauqua, which was, uh, Holly had mentioned about us working there, and, and it forced us to kind of go into a situation where everything was fired in a, at a mid-range temperature which uh, both of us had been unfamiliar with and um, so over those summers became very uh, became more acquainted with it and uh, developed a, a vocabulary for me in, in forms and glaze and so the remainder of the the pieces and I still even to today, still work in, in mid-range. Um, I do work at the, when I was at UT, uh, we would fire in high temperature and I would teach the students uh, high temperature uh, techniques and, and using the stoneware clay and the porcelain clay. And, but uh, in my own studio, I would focus in working in the mid-range materials. So conceptually, most of the work uh, that I was kind of focused on would be on the far left, which was thinking about the shapes and forms that would be generated on the wheel and how that would relate to forms in nature. And there was the, I became aware of the, the gyres that were in the oceans and, and the, obviously the, the, there's the large islands of plastic that would be formed in those and thinking about how the ceramic cup would could possibly play a role in and you know kind of preventing that and so the the forms that were generated generated on the wheel and and the the piece itself uh basically formed an uh a usable object the piece you see in the center um that was came out of the uh, looking at how people would do tree topping in, in Tennessee, and they may do that in other other states as well, but it seemed to be pretty prevalent here. And so, um, using that as a way to kind of decorate the form, and a, a lot of the work was uh, that I had done pr prior to this was was very colorful and and used a lot of uh, stains and things like that, and what I decided to do was just to kind of back off that and just kind of work with the form and, and the shape. And then the cup on the, the far right um, is dealing with objects that uh, I would find in our garden and things that were growing and, and still using the, the shaping processes that you would find on the wheel and, and handmade forms and things like that to kind of suggest those objects that you would find in nature. That that work uh, continued to kind of grow into uh, the vase and the the covered container on the left is a butter dish, and so using the wheel as a tool to generate forms to kind of 
uh, construct the pieces. Uh, a lot of altering would be done after the, the piece was together and, and thinking about these pieces and how they would uh, work in an exhibit or if they would have uh, actual butter in them or if they had flowers in them as well. Uh, this is the last piece that was in a show at uh, the University of Tennessee uh, just before I uh, retired. Uh, this is a, these are larger pieces that, that deal with gar still gardening. And this is coming out of uh, a couple of years of COVID and thinking about uh, sheltering. And, and we built a big garden in our backyard, a large raised bed. And thinking about how that uh, you know, working with multiples and that idea of, of objects being kind of sheltered. We had to put up fences to keep the, the groundhogs out of the, the garden because they were just, the rabbits and the groundhogs were just kind of making a feast of our uh, garden. So thinking about how we had to protect ourselves and, and going to the grocery store and wearing masks and, and uh, you know all of the the business that we were going through at that time uh, as individuals. Um, and then these are things that I'm still thinking about. This these are probably um, dealing with the food that um, baking in the foods, kind of testing them. There's uh, use a lot of. Uh, I've recently, uh, probably about three years ago, went kind of full keto, low carb, and so really kind of experimenting with with uh, the diet and thinking about um, low carb, high uh, high protein meals and things like that, and how to how to how that would work for me is how that would work for other people. And really it's kind of forced me to use whole foods rather than processed foods. And so I've kind of come upon uh, that in the studio thinking about ways to present those objects in the home. And so thinking about uh, using those objects, what could be uh, useful for making coffee, using, you know, weighing your beans out and dosing them and thinking about colors that I wear and, and, and how those could be also used in, in the, the process of, of finishing the wear. Uh, some of the, the forms looking in, in the garden and looking at the moss and thinking about uh, the dishes that you eat off of and how that could be somehow translated to that uh, eating to device. And also thinking about uh, forms that uh, there were forms when that I've kind of revisited that were probably from the Kansas City years that were dealing a little bit more with figurative gestural drawings that um, I've kind of come back to. And so these are three-sided uh, forms. And so there's a, a, a face on each of the three sides. You just really only seeing one side of the vase right now. And they're really pretty wonderful and enjoyable with something inside them. And so I think that uh, for me that making an object that I can see right away and see how it's uh, used is enjoyable. And, and um, when I've had shows and, and exhibited these, people are really, uh, engaged in these as well, and and um, and there's something that I really can't uh, keep on hand that I have to keep making more because uh, people seem to enjoy those in their lives as well. Uh, a lot of the the things that I'm doing right now with uh, these forms are uh, Glenn Lukens, which is a, a California artist. And the way he was working with textural forms and, and glazes and um, the, the, this black glaze that I'm using with, with the glaze that's high in magnesium over the top of it gives this uh, kind of crackled kind of effect, but yet it's still smooth and it's functional that can be used for, for dinnerware. 
These are uh, some large on the right are images of some large uh, serving dishes and, and some saucers. And then on the left is uh, cups without the saucers. And here's the saucers with those pieces. And this actually, you know, with, with coffee in it, so that you can kind of get an idea of what that would look like. And then these are some nine inch uh, dinner plates. Working with the same thing. And probably one of the, the newest tool that we have in the studio uh, is this slab roller. And so that's uh, allowed me to, to work with a, another tool that I've used the wheel for so many years. And since uh, 1977, I worked on the wheel. And I think even when coming to Kansas City for the first year, there was only one semester where we hand built. And then uh, and then I felt I could use the wheel as a, as a tool like the slab roller because the slab roller was upstairs and it was just too many steps to <laughs> go up there to make slabs and then bring it down to the senior area. Uh, so this is an opportunity for me to to create with the the slab roller and it's opened up a lot of kind of wonderful possibilities to to deal with the surface and so uh in in my process i'm i'm really kind of asking questions and working through the problems of of utility and then um i'll normally i'll i'll build pieces or I'll throw pieces and then assemble them and and uh, apply them together depending on what uh, what my needs are. And then I'll use the whatever technique that I'm using as part of the process that kind of will kind of show a sense of of how it was made. And then the, the you know the objects that if they're new objects, usually they'll end up in in the kitchen or in the home, and they'll be analyzed to kind of decide if if I'm going to go ahead or if changes need to be made, and if or if if they need to be larger or the the glaze needs to be changed or the size needs to be changed for something else. But that'll that'll pretty much inform what happens in the studio now, where um, it was probably not that focused as, as, as it is now because of how close the home is to the studio. And then I'm going to turn it over to Polly Ann. So um, in terms of uh, my work, um, I started throwing in Oklahoma, um, went on to continue my studies at Wichita State. And um, I had an affinity really strongly for the wheel right off the bat. And there was something to be said about those wonderful Randall wheels, um, the old locker bees. But I was always drawn to, to the wheels that um, actually didn't have the motors. I really enjoyed that cadence that I could um, utilize just in terms of that, that kind of steady kick and the rhythm that was offered. When I... Um, um, when I think of my work, um, I've always been very, very much dedicated to function and utility. My early background um, in childhood was I was raised in an extraordinarily rich ethnic um, culture, neighborhood. Um, I was very fortunate that I had a slew of sisters that could cook extraordinary meals as well as my mother. And one of the things that I um, really, really love about just that whole sense of domesticity and home is all the different um, riches of stories, narratives that can happen and how that whole gathering can transform the experience. I didn't know that I would be a potter as a child, um, but I do know that once um, I started um, finding my interest with that material when I got to undergraduate studies and, and college, um, there was no question that it was um, then my uh, continued focus from there. Um, some of my um, very, very early inspirations um, not only were my mother cooking in the home, 
I grew up in a Czech and Polish um, kitchen. Um, one of the beauties that I uh, usually share with um, an opportunity uh, with folks is one of the things that I absolutely love about the culinary world is that one simple ingredient can transform a whole meal. So in our kitchen, which was a Polish kitchen, my mother would instantly take out caraway seeds and she'd be putting it into some type of a sausage or with fennel. I would go into our neighbor's kitchen and they were Irish and they would be putting those same caraway seeds into scones. I'd go into um, another uh, childhood friend's home who was Indian and her mother would put caraway seeds into some other type of a dish as well. I'd go into a German kitchen who was another friend of ours and they'd be putting it into sauerkraut. So there was a commonality in terms of different types of ingredients, but also the richness of those family traditions and dishes. And one of the things that I remember with absolute kind of glee and joy was the era of when Julia Child was on. And my mother, it was, it was one of those moments, no one really watched TV when I was a kid, but when Julia Child, that hour came on, we all went running, <laughs> we all watched it. Um, when I then got married with Frank, um, Jacques Pepin, he was um, starting his shows and then they were cooking together. And I just thought, oh, this is just too, too incredibly wonderful. Um, that whole history of food, gastronomy always has interested me, different types of dishes, different forms that are used for paella or different types of casserole forms, that specificity of form has always really interested me, especially when making work. So undergraduate work um, in Kansas City was uh, essentially kind of those early development of forms, quieter forms, but looking at the history of forms. Um, as, uh, as with Janet um, and Frank, we had an opportunity to study with Ken, with Victor, and with George, but I also had my first summer with Clary Illion, and um, that's when I was first introduced to the treadle wheel. Um, she recognized that my forms were rather quiet, and she saw me working on a, a Randall wheel, and um, she encouraged Ken to dig out uh, one of the treadles for me. And so that was my first opportunity to work with a treadle because of her. My second summer uh, was with Karen Carnes. And by that time, um, I, it was rare at that moment to have women who were teaching ceramics. Betty uh, was the only one out of, Calif you know, out of uh, Colorado um, that was teaching. And, and I had had all women teachers as a child uh, through my sisters and my mother. But as I got into undergraduate school, it was almost a male dominated society. And so those two summers were intensely valuable for me. Um, that first with Clary and the second with Karen. And that was really um, quite, quite a move in my life. Um, Karen had uh, she's from, she was from um, the Northern Kingdom of Vermont. Um, and uh, she shared her life with Ann Standard. Um, she was married at one time to David Weinreb, who um, in the 50s, they were a major part of the development of the ceramic phase um, at Blackberry or uh, Black Mountain College. Um, and David uh, was a hand builder, Karen always threw. But um, Karen offered me an opportunity to quietly talk about my work, um, but also have a strong voice in terms of what I wanted to say with the clay to really, really understand it. Um, she gave me some foundational roots that allowed me um, entrance into a whole world of being able to want that articulation of, um, of, of being a maker, essentially. Um, some of my pieces from uh, graduate school, um, I started um, doing some research um, in gastronomy. I, I got full into the history of food. I read a lot of Waverly Roots books. Um, if anybody ever gets into New York City, um, there's a store that is 94th and Lex, which is Kitchen Arts and Letters, which is really dedicated to um, a, a foodie store, but all cookbooks. But it was kind of like my library for me. Um, when I would want to make a form, I would certainly look at recipes and then um, offer that specificity of form. And so um, with the combination of finding the right tools, um, the, the 
joy for me is at the time, Frank, you know, he's got 50, 60 tools, an electric wheel, and I'm off in my corner uh, with maybe five tools and a kick wheel you know, and a treadle. So there's just differences of how each person is working and that it's been a joy to kind of parallel that. So um, for their, for a cer certain period of time in making domestic pottery, um, I really was focused on um, either given an opportunity to go to a museum was one for research, but also just cookbooks. Um, and walking into the front room of our house, we probably have, I don't, I can't even count how many. We have shelf upon shelf upon shelf of just different cookbooks from different um, countries, different cultures, and um, just sitting there for hours, um, you know, maybe making a dish that was for roasted asparagus or poached fish or of the like. One of the things that I also found coming from a larger family, whether it was a king's table or a harvest table, uh, forms that can be passed easily are long and oval. Um, you can fit them in anywhere between 12, 15 people. And so even just the gathering of people made a difference in terms of the forms that I would produce. Um, I wanted to put in a slide um, in terms of teaching. Um, I didn't realize how important teaching was gonna come to me. Um, I've always said I'll stop teaching when I'm when I feel like I'm done with it. Um, I'm headed for my years of uh, my 60 years, and um, I don't feel like I'm done teaching yet. I feel like I'll know that time. Frank felt um, this past year he was at a point, although I have brought him up to Blackberry Mountain to help teach even last week. So, I mean, you're lost. So he's teacher. a reluctant, but he's there. So. But um, I really, really do love an opportunity to uh, share ideas, to, to observe, to look. And I think one of the things about teaching is that you have to be an extraordinary listener. Um, there's an enormous amount of pause that comes into the ability to communicate ideas. And um, making uh, it makes you feel as though you're part of someone's journey. And I really do value that process. Uh, a couple of pieces here are from uh, different shows that I was in, the specificity of forms. Um, I love condiments. I love um, all sorts of herbs that grow in the garden, infused oils, vinegars, etc. cetera. Um, also, um, I, I was told once, um, John Glick became a large part of my life in graduate school. And um, I don't have a photograph of him, but um, and I'll, I'll digress for a minute, but there is an old John Cage quote that as a paraphrase, you know, you enter your studio, your creative space with your friends, your enemies, your family, et cetera, and one by one, um, they all leave. And eventually, if you're so lucky or if you're super lucky, even you will leave. And I think of that often. Um, John Glick offered me an opportunity to really understand space. Um, when I first got to graduate school, it wasn't even a week that I was there, and um, he called me and said, I heard that you're a potter, and I'd like to, to be here and support you during your studies at graduate school. I did not know him. I knew of his work. I loved his work. Um, I became a person who was fond of him, um, and he gave me an opportunity, invited me every single Friday to his studio. Um, and he let me bring one piece every Friday as a critique, which was really, really extraordinary. Um, there was so many different things he taught me personally about business, professionally. Um, and in that very first week, he talked to Graham and he measured my legs and uh, made me a seat um, that would fit a treadle that was one of Maya Grotel's old treadle wheels that came out of storage. So there was a real interest in tools, even for um, kind of the subtle that didn't speak up very much, but it, it really, it really happened. Um, I started making forms um, off the basis of, of John. He was talking very, very uh, strongly about Potters generally have a vocabulary of it, a minimum of five forms that they love to throw. Um, and from there you grow, there's freedom within that limitation in terms of the functionality of it. But um, 
one of the forms that I've always loved to throw our bases. So that is definitely uh, part of my uh, kind of common um, pattern in my studio. Um, the other thing, I know it, it may sound silly to some, but I love butter. <laughs> I make butter dishes. I make small butter pat dishes, um, butter covers, that kind of thing. Um, there was a time where um, I was doing a little bit more off the wheel um, as well. This was pre-slab uh, roller, but nonetheless, um, I really do love patterning. I generally will use one glaze on forms um, and, um, you know, have those pieces unfold. Um, there's a lot of my forms that have kind of an addition to them as a surface. Um, I really love a kind of a hobbled, um, like old hobbled glass where there's like those not hobnail edges. And I love the accents that that can offer to a form, just kind of that um, separation of space and pause within the shape. I do work in a series. Um, my methodology is definitely not one or two forms. Um, I do get into a rhythm. I can say that um, I draw a lot. Um, generally speaking, when I reflect back on uh, a, a table that I've produced some pieces, my first or my third or fifth or seventh, it's the odd number forms that I really, really love. And I pick out, I look at those shadows, I look at what I've done, I reflect on the drawings that I've done. Um, but I certainly um, weigh my clay out and um, rhythm happens with the setting the same music in your head, using the same tools and the orchestration of how you utilize that space and then just letting uh, yourself um, feel that you could lose time. And I think that that's a wonderful thing for everybody. So different studio spaces, um, our summer studios, we would have to set up each and every year uh, at Chautauqua. And so here's uh, just a small gathering of some forms from one of those past summers. And then this is my studio space now. Um, this is kind of a sampling of uh, just us unloading one of the mid-range kilns that we have. Um, I have an area of my uh, treadle that looks out onto our garden and um, those forms uh, with the table. Um, it's, I have to say, it's been wonderful. I, um, I know that Frank and I have been together for 39 years. I, I kind of pinch myself every day, but it's been a joy to see him more at home uh, producing um, even more than he used to. Uh, but also uh, we're enjoying a lot of time in the studio together these days, which has been really wonderful. What's the view? So last couple of pieces, um, probably within the last, I don't know, four months or something within that scope of time, just, you know, documenting, um, having things be part of sales. And this, this image I usually end with, um, in any of my presentations, it really does speak to much about what I think about the hand and how a cup itself will nurture that whole experience of, of uh, food nourishment, et cetera. I also wanted to put in my working process. Um, I'm, I won't read through it, but really what I do feel about clay, um, you know, why the, the question that any one of us can ask why clay as opposed to glass or wood or metal, um, for me, clay really is a physical journal of my experience. There's a rhythm, there's a cadence. Um, I really do feel profoundly um, strong about having a treadle wheel to work with. The sound of it, uh, the nature, the quietness, the grace of it is really, really powerful me, for me when I'm in the studio. But as, as clay itself, um, it's a record of the experience. It can look like metal. It can look like it has hard edges, but it's also a record of that physical manifestation of how we touch something and the malleability of it, the plasticity of it. It's not elastic. It doesn't bounce back on itself. It does have that plastic quality. It does have that opportunity to celebrate sculpture. Um, all of those opportunities for that material is something that I really love. And that is one of the mainstays of why I have chosen to stay with clay. So we thought that, that 
um, with this particular group after visiting with Foz, after visiting with Janet, um, we wanted to also share kind of the last few slides at the end, um, which has to do with our home sales. We've We've certainly um, participated in a lot of um, larger craft fair sales through our life, through um, through holiday sales, through different markets. Um, one of the largest uh, comebacks for us is a home sale. Um, I remember um, an adage that I was that I shared with Clary at one point, and she had said that you'd know where you were in your career. Um, when you were asked to make pieces for a family. You'd understand your career better when you were making pieces for their children, and you'd really understand your age when you were making pieces for their grandchildren. And so <laughs> that's pretty much the space that we're at right now is we're beginning to make pieces for grandchildren. So I feel like I'm a, a part of that generational uh, experience in terms of uh, being a maker. But these independent slides are um, from uh, Frank unloading a kiln to some of his, his forms as we unload, just laying things out, readying them for market. And then for our sales that we have at home, we've had you know many in New York City, we've had many at home, we've had many at other friends' house with friends, et cetera, with other sales. But if we are doing um, market, it, I think it's important for any one of us, and I think we all could speak to this. Isn't my? I am not a single voice here. Is just making sure that you're you're advertising or you're putting yourself out there differently. It can't. It's not that it can't. It just suggested that you put a new form out there every day to remind people. We all have um, calendars. We all mark it down, but if you are have the opportunity for something like social media to put a new form out every day, people are looking at it and seeking it. And um, it's really interesting the feedback that you do get uh, when people are coming to the sales because they'll actually bring those images with them. And they'll say, do you remember this piece that was by the orange, you know, <laughs> and then you'll be able to kind of mark that uh, for it and save that for them. So it's a variety of different forms of both of our work together. It's not necessary that it has to, but we coexist and we cer certainly make both functional and utilitarian pieces. And then this is what it feels like when it's getting stacked and ready to kind of be in our position to display things. And um, uh, Frank can speak to this more, but um, the, the central um, kind of, laddered uh, shelving unit um, is all about how it can break down. Um, you know, we all have a lot of things. Things don't break down like they do or accordion fold into something like it could be uh, in a smaller fashion, whether it was um, handmade wearables, et cetera. So it has to do with, you know, how you can set up and break down, what kind of containers you use, et cetera. Um, this past season, we um, have had many friends that have had one day sales. We tried, we thought we'd try a three day sale. Um, open the first one in the evening, have a full one on the second day and full on the third. And um, I can share, Frank and I definitely got uh, feedback from uh, friends and clients that came that felt that they really, really enjoyed having the versatility because we actually did see people that came back on that third day. Um, they may have saw something or thought of another gift that they needed. So that kind of longer sale was really, really helpful for us. And then Frank can speak to this right so, here. And then in, in the, the spring and the fall semester we have at, at the University of Tennessee, they have a student uh, run sale. And so there's a, a student president, elected president, and then an elected vice president. And then I'm the treasurer uh and until they decide that they're going to do a search for the next person and that person wants to take that responsibility over um so uh i work with the the students we put together a show that um will have facilities we'll bring over tables and uh we will cover those tables and then the students will put work out there 
it's a it's a way for students to have a different type of education where the, that they aren't really taught in school. So it teaches them marketing. It teaches them about pricing their work, and it gives them an opportunity to either make because it is in an art building. It gives them the opportunity to to make pieces that might be uh, within a family. They don't necessarily have to be uh, as, you know an exact set like a, a production potter might be, if, if, if that's not a consideration. We do have um, anywhere between two and maybe four alumni that will be present, that uh, folks that have graduated from the University of, of Tennessee, either as a grad student or an undergrad and are still in the area. And so they are welcome to come back and participate. Uh, I think just like your sales, the to, to keep the the club running uh they will take a, a percentage we, we will take a a 40 percent uh take and what but that what that also gives them is that when it comes around to time for Enseca or if if during a summer there's uh some activity that they want to go to that's an educational activity they can apply for a, a scholarship through the ut potters and if they've um, if they've at least for that one, you know, two or one or two uh, sales, if they've made a hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, they can get um, at least a hundred dollars back, or for you know, for that uh, activity. Um, there's also student competitions that that take place in the, the university. Uh, at at the university gallery and, and um, uh, for awards for those that they get earmarked for ceramic pieces, the UT Potters will donate uh, money that will go to those awards that the juror will select and, and they'll get like a, a $250, $300 award for first and second place. And um, and that this is this has gone on for over 27 years or 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 I think even even longer than that. I the Jim Darrell, the the guy, fellow who came in um uh years ago before the University of uh the ceramics department was was part of the School of Art. It was part of Home Ec, and then it transferred over to the School of Art. And so Jim Darrell brought uh that club over to the the school of art and the interesting thing is is that it's it's uh there are other student clubs but they're part of the university this is separate so it's sort of like a maybe a, a what you would consider like a, a boy or a girl scouts club and that allows them to to kind of keep the money separate from the university and they can use it uh let's say for example if if there's a, a kiln that is over fired and they need to replace it and they can't get money from the university or they need new kiln shelves things like that and so it can can work for uh supplies and things like that for the students as well that that um if they can't get money from the the university so it's a it's a nice little option for them cool and so right here um I don't know if it, will that work on there. It, it'll. It, there's a there's a small. Um, I don't know if it'll work on your end, Janet. Do you think it'll play? No, I have yeah. to. I have to share. The thing it. that's different about a Verbo vacation home. You always have the whole place to yourself. Mm -hmm. Stranger at the dinner table making things awkward, or in another room taking up space. It's just you and your. So here's a small, here's a small one. One of the things that's been so important to us at the mountain was bringing our art program to life, whether it's in the studio or out on the trails. We made a conscious decision not to put some of our surprise art installations on the map. And, you know, you could argue both ways on that, but we felt like it was fun, just that element of surprise, discovery. There's a little bit of reward in there. For a place to create art, it's an awe-inspiring environment. 
the property itself is just one of the most amazing beloved parcel of earth that I've experienced. It's interesting how as we evolve into our adulthood, a lot of our creative juices might kind of get pushed aside. And I think that for adults, especially to get in the studio or get outside painting, just kind of reuniting with those tools and using our hands in the pottery studio, I think it's really great for the brain to just kind of tap into that side of the brain that maybe we're, we're shutting down when we're being efficient and working and responsible. I love that we're adding that element for our guests. In terms of the guest perspective, there is something that really does happen in a magical way. To make art, it's the beginning of a dialogue. It's the beginning of a conversation. It's an opportunity where um, there can be a vulnerability with guests. There's also an opportunity, especially being Blackberry itself, um, where guests give themselves permission to create. They have maybe perhaps always dreamt of a certain medium or a certain particular kind of way of looking um, with, within the arts. They let themselves enjoy the moment. For me, art takes so many different forms. There's the really obvious ones like a painting or a sculpture, but then there's just the incredible art forms that I think are in mother nature, whether it's how the light hits something or the shape of a tree. I love for people to have that opportunity to kind of tap back into those creative juices that might be kind of snuffed out. So that's a that's a small um, that's a small parcel of um, video that they've done on the studio, and um, we we'd be happy to have dialogue, answer questions, um, learn what you all do, um, you know what your walks of life bring uh, in terms of your experiences with clay. We'd love to open up the dialogue if anybody has any questions. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, what is your particular sort of um, work rhythm in terms of, do you throw say for two or three days and then you trim and then you just say put handles on things or how do you, how do you, what's your work rhythm in terms of your series? How many days of doing it's, this? It's, and it's, then... kind of, it's kind of a, for me, it's a multiple um, answer. Um, one of the things that when we were at Chautauqua, I asked that very question to Bill Daly. Mm. And, um, he had, we were, he and Kate and I and Frank were sitting outside at twilight in the day. And he said that um, one of the things that he promised himself was that every single day he was going to go into the studio and that um, even through his years of being a professor emeritus and all the students and walks of life that he went through with PCA, he had said that it was really important to connect to something that he had that passion for. And he said, and he, truthfully, he said some days it was really brutal. Um, because he was so exhausted from teaching um, and being dedicated with kids and the family and et cetera. But he still made that connection every single day for at least 15 minutes. And he would even put a timer on. Um, but he said that oftentimes, and he said it in a joking manner, that his, he would pick up a broom and just start sweeping. And he had the cleanest studio, um, you know, west or east of the Mason-Dixon line kind of thing. <laughs> But he still made the connection, but he said the reason why he did it was for one thing, was that if there was a time when he was in his total phase of exhaustion, that he, when he started working, um, that 15 minutes could turn into 16 and he wouldn't know it. He wouldn't recognize that time went by. And he realized how important that connection was. In terms of my work, I happen to be an extraordinarily early morning person. So I can be set up and throwing in my studio 5, 30, 6 o'clock and love that rhythm. I love the quietness of the dark. I know that there's some people that love the 3 o'clock in the morning time of the dark, which is not me. 
<laughs> but I love I love to see the sun light come into the room that was one of the things that we noticed about all the backgrounds for you all that you all had sun that was coming through some of your curtains it was still light there but um and we're in in the dark hour but um the shy of that is that um I'll work in a series I'll um you know wedge up maybe 20 balls of clay or if it's an idea I'll wedge up five but I always work in a series of forms and then cover um Angela Fina Massachusetts Potter beloved old friend that has passed now she had a very active garden um as we do and Angela used to say that her garden would always beckon her um and she would wear a, a stopwatch on her neck like a necklace and give herself 17 minutes in the garden and then she'd force herself <laughs> to come back into the studio so everyone has their own rhythm you know if you can you know do a clip of 3 or 4 days that's incredible um you know my my time right now i am managing the studio so there's a there's a division of time but um i still work within that rhythm Frank, you know, you can speak I mean, to that I mean, differently. For me, it, I mean, part of it is, it, you know, I, th I think about what's my inventory. And then also I think about um, it's it's part about fulfilling a need. And it's also still in that mindset of any time that you present work to other people, it's, it's about this, the exhibition and providing something that... Um, that's familiar and something that might be challenging and something that um, uh, that you that you know that you want them to use that maybe they wouldn't have considered a, a shape or a form or something like that and and a lot of times there'll be forms that I'll make and I'm I think that there's a a, a particular uh, use for them and and. People are, are they want to they want they're taking them home and I'm asking them what what they're using for and and they're using them for something completely different than what I intended them for, and I don't mind that. Um, I mean, for me, it's just it's just to to get clay into people's lives and 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 you know if if I can keep making more work so that that I can provide that you know access of clay to that person and i'm providing uh work that they can't get someplace else or they you know it and i'm working in smaller batches i don't work in large runs of, of ceramics because it allows me to kind of change the way i work and i and i like the idea of thinking about our sales as maybe a pop-up rather than than a a bricks and mortar type situation and so it's it's kind of like going to the bakery you you know you you go in and and you can you know you there's there's new things there and there's things that you know that's there there's specials um you know i i enjoy that when when you do that and then it's like if you go back to the bakery again you know there's something new and it tempts you and you you want to try it and you bring it into your life and um you know and you just kind of complete that that circle from you know studio to the process the idea and then you you put this you know object into somebody's hand and then you know and you're just keeping your fingers crossed that they're going to enjoy it just as much as you did and and um we we had this really wonderful thing that happened at the our very last sale because as much as any one of us may have the intention of form for certain ideas, it's not that we're going to limit someone in terms of the way that they utilize a shape. But Frank had just finished these really large, at least a, it would hold like a gallon of food, um, uh, really large cradle bowls that he was exploring the forms with um, on the slab roller. And the very first the very first piece that sold at the last holiday sale was one of these really large, you know, put your arm around the shape pieces. And the person took it from the shelf and started to have this level of kind of emotional connectiveness to it. And then unfolded and just said, I have been looking for a form like this and just mm -hmm. went, on, went on a cord about how wonderful it was and 
you know, she described it in an articulate way that neither of us could even approach at that time. And at one point after her kind of share, her dialogue, Frank had said, well, how do you imagine using this? <laughs> it was such an endearing thing. And she almost had a shyness, but she said, this is for my dad. And um, she said, he has been trying to find a dish that's perfect for his little Debbie cake. <laughs> It was so endearing, but it was so specific to what she wanted for him. And, and then she had sent a picture and it was just, it was as lovely as could be. We didn't envision it. It wasn't, you know, perhaps the intention of the way we saw it, but it was really lovely. So it was a nice, it was a really nice share. Yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always fascinating for me to, you know, there's making an object with a certain intent that somebody will, uh, kind of collaborate with you to to come up with another use for it and yeah. and I enjoy that aspect of the process immensely I I have a question I'm yeah. you know I, I looked at the images of your work from your weekend sale your holiday sale and there were vases and there were plates and platters and bowls and then I see the more, you know, Frank's um, interpretations of cups, um, you know, with vines and stumps. And so is, is there a difference, when you, when you do your work, is there a difference between what you're, uh, what you're looking at for an exhibition, which I'm going to assume maybe some of the teapots and the and the cups that you showed us versus the other work. And do you intentionally say, I'm going to work on this really more fluid space? I mean, what, how do you in your head decide what, what you're going to approach with the clay or is it what the clay does with you? Well, well, for, for me, it, it's, it's depending on what the venue is and making the work that's appropriate for that. If it's, if, if the if the venue is is dedicated to something that's maybe a little more dealing heavy on the, the leaning more on the concept than than the the utility of it, I think the you'll see the work go more towards that other direction. Um, it 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 may it may not be work that that people can kind of wrap their head around and think about. Um, you know, how am I going to, you know. Would, would I drink coffee out of this every day? Pro probably not. I, you know, you might, my intent is that maybe that somebody would drink coffee out of that as a special occasion, but it would still be, um, I mean, I would do it, but, but it would probably, you know, there were, there would be things about it that it would be a little harder to wash. It would be a little bit you'd have to kind of watch out for those those little kind of tendril things that come off that you wouldn't want to break those off, uh, you know, if, if you were mishandling it and stuff like that. And so depending on, you know, the, the individual's lifestyle, you know, um, those pieces are are about um, the idea of, of, a, of a cup or what a cup could be. And for me, you know, they they become a little bit more conceptual. They become more like uh, something that uh, could be a little bit kind of blending sculpture and and utility together. And and then the the other pieces um, that that you see in the 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 sh slides that are about the pieces that are in the the pop up sales that we have. Um, those are about making work that that would be a little bit more um, easier for somebody to use and, and easier for somebody to wrap their head around. But but I'm still, you know, I mean, even with the, the glaze surfaces and things like that, trying to challenge the person a little bit. And I feel like that's enough where they can kind of do that. But if 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 they think that there's something that might make it difficult, a little bit more awkward for them to use or things like that i think they kind of shy away but but it but those pieces will also be in that that pop-up show to kind of because you want to kind of educate people 
So you you put in things that maybe are a little bit challenging along with the other things. And then, you know, sometimes they they wander over to those pieces and uh, they, they'll ask you a question. Well, what would you use that for? You know, what, you know, how are you supposed to use that? And you, and you explain that it's, you know, it's something that can be decorative and, and, and can be viewed and, and, and thought about. It can also be something that can be used. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question, um, yeah. especially with your long careers in academia and teaching. Do you think there's been a little bit of a change in focus more towards sculptural pieces than functional pieces? I, in term I think I, I apologize for interrupting. I, it. Um, I think it ebb and flows. There's, there's, there can be phases, which there's, it's such a magical thing that happens. Um, I remember, um, you know, different phases of one, one of the shows that I used to be a part of that was an invitational was the old church sale that was in Demarest, New Jersey, that Karen Carnes and Michael Zakin used to um, host. And that's right around the holiday, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Um, no question, hands down, it's a community. I don't know, some of you may be familiar with it, but it is a community sale. It's a, um, a clay studio that Michael Zakin um, really had her hand in um, for many, many, many years. And then Karen would come down and invite about 30 different potters between she and Michael. And um, they would always seek out younger potters as well. Um, and there was such a breath of fresh air coming from all sorts of avenues. It, it doesn't mean that there's certain schools. I know that, um, you know, for a little while at um, University of Minnesota, there was, you know, it was almost dedicated to uh, people who were studying, her, you know, Curtis Horde or Mark Ferris or, um, you know, certainly this, you know, Alfred or Lincoln, Nebraska with Gail Kendall. And, you know, there can be different phases, Linda Arbuckle out in um, Florida, but certain um, kind of waves of people would come. And while sculpture has always been, uh, you know, a part of, you know, early ancient times as well, whether it was deities or fertility gods or abstract, you know, architecture, there's no question that utility and function still has its mainstay. I remember, remember there was a talk that that um, when Robert Arneson had come to Kansas City one time, and and there was a, a a talk that he gave, and he really talked about the importance of the styrofoam cup, and that the styrofoam cup would do what a functional cup does, and. My argument for that was that there was human connection in terms of you know utility of clay, and I think that that's what people seek out. I, Frank and I've talked. This maybe may digress a bit, but we all went through the pandemic, each and every one of us. And if you didn't come out better for it on one side, I know there was a great loss for many families, a lot of sorrow on one side and disbelief. But if you didn't come out growing from that experience, having kind of reconnected with each other, somehow you did it wrong. You know, we had a chance to be together. We had a chance to grow together as families. And um, it was an opportunity to reflect and just, you know, commune with one another and, um, you know, share time with each other. And, you know, we all have an opportunity to do that, whether it is clay sculpture in our home and talk about it or utility or function. Um, I'm hooked to uh, toward uh, making pots, uh, but doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of other things in our house too. What, what I found at, at the University um, of Tennessee and, and other schools is that you, you have, you, you're having a lot of, and that would probably be I would say, let's look back about five, 10 years, you start to see a lot of crossover. You see multidisciplinary uh, people in, in different areas. So if you, you might have a, a painter that's working in clay, you might have a, a sculptor that's, that's working in sound. You have uh, 2D, 3D, and 4D. And, and you really, um, 
it really kind of becomes a, um, a focus in studio art rather than uh, an area. It, it, let's say if it's heavy in clay or heavy in painting or printmaking or photography or something like that. And so you'll have a thesis show that that will have uh, video and clay and and paintings and um, installation, you know, temporal pieces, things like that, uh, that um, that you really, you know, the the things that I that I that I came in into that program where you really saw that there was a strong base in each area. You see less of that now, and you see more of a crossover. And it seems though that you know if if you if you were a student and you were trying to focus on let's say you know a a, a clay based education, it would be hard to to kind of find that in some of the schools now because I I don't know um, you know it, it would be I mean even though I've I've left UT that I still get calls back to ask about firing the kiln there's they're having problems and stuff like that so so you see you know and and you see more and more areas uh across the country where they have a technician that that takes care of all of that you, usually it was the department head or the department head and and the students that were taking care of the the kilns and and the equipment and things like that and so you see less and less and and places like you know where you're at i mean that that's where people are going to get their education you know if it's if they want it to be a a full heavy you know clay based education you know so i think it's you know as polly was saying is it's it's kind of swings back and forth mm -hmm. you know and i think you know right now we're seeing it swing swing one way you know i mean if 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 you know if i think if you're going to get, try and get a job as a professor now, uh, as in a tenure track job, you need to have video, a video background in video. You need to know how to work a 3D printer. You need to know how to fire a blow kiln. You need to have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of different backgrounds other than just kind of working in clay. You know, so that you can, you know, fulfill that that role. Thank you. That's. That's good yeah. of it. <laughs> and I think uh, it's getting late over there. So if there's a, a last question, and then perhaps if uh, people, our membership has other questions, maybe they can just email you and connect yeah. that way. Well, it's been a pleasure um, being able to share. Um, we're, um, we also just want to say honestly thank you this was an opportunity for frank and yeah. i to kind of put this together um as kind of a, a joint presentation we, we've certainly heard each other talk through the years independently but it was a real cha real chance for us to um you know kind of put our thoughts together in in that joint way um <laughs> I do want to say there was one thing, I don't know why this is relevant, but I guess it is, and it's not because it's California, but um, Malcolm Davis, a really well-known potter and beloved um, friend that passed, he was very good friends with the Hinos, and um, Vivica, when Frank and I were younger, um, many, many years ago, we were all at some gathering and Vivica had spotted me and I didn't know that she was aware of Frank and I in any level. And of course there was this huge like want to have met her and him as well. And she had seen me and she asked Malcolm to go fetch us. <laughs> and so um, he did so and he said that, you know, you've been requested at the table and so we came over and and Fifth looked at Otto and said move <laughs> she she kind of patted the seat so that I would sit next to her and it was 
extraordinarily intimidating, but very, very welcoming at the same time, because there was a genuine sweetness about her. And so she pointed to where Frank should sit next to Otto. I um, was invited to sit next to her and she leaned over to me and she said, I have some very, something very important to share with you. And I thought, oh man, you know, if there was a moment not to talk and to listen, this is the moment of my life. So she looked at me dead pan in the eye and she said, I have, this is important. She said, and I want you to hear me. And I said, yes. And she looks at Frank, she points to him. She looks back at me and she says, you must at all times keep him on his toes. <laughs> I just thought, it was such a funny share and I just thought of all things you know um and my favorite moment was when she passed and we were very much aware of that later autumn you know life era of their lives when he then when she passed when he bought the red Rolls Royce I mean, it was just so fabulous I thought there's something really quite wonderful about um that kind of life process and you know kind of owning each each of your energies so anyway it was just a, a funny thing to share Thank there's a lot so there's, much. There, there's so many stories that that any one of us could share with each other of what we've learned exactly. I mean I, I mean I remember I remember Robert Turner having him give a give me a critique one time and he he spent 30 minutes in my studio he looked at everything and then he turned crazy but he turned and then he put my my face in his hands in a very personal way <laughs> and he looked at me he said everything will be okay <laughs> I mean it was just like that but that was Robert Turner's way of doing things you know and to me it's still a very very powerful thing that everything will be okay I don't know what he saw um, he pointed out a few things later but sometimes there's certain messages that people just want to share with you for whatever reason and if you're listening you hear them so mm -hmm. yeah anyway janet it's great to see your face great to see great you to again see you. Foz. incredible nice Thank to meet you. all of you um but reach out um and we'd love to share our sto our story more um certainly share your stories so yeah thank you so much yeah absolutely Thank you. Thank you all for your time. And we've, you. Got, we've got notes here just that says what a privilege to hear both of no, you. Oh, absolutely. It's our yeah. it's, uh, absolutely our pleasure. We'll, we'll we'll keep we'll keep looking at your site and seeing what everybody's doing. Um, it'll be a real pleasure to be able to, you know, con continue to stay connected. So absolutely. and uh, good luck on your upcoming shows and sales. sales yeah. And um, enjoy each other. Have a potluck. Um, have another one. <laughs> um, and you all you much. have a good thank night's you. sleep because it's really late where you yeah. are. <laughs> We're good. It was a real pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much for thank the opportunity. You. Thank, you. thank you. Have a lovely thank evening. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Go. Okay. Unless anyone has any last minute questions. No May meeting. May no. meeting is the potluck and the pit fire at Arroyo Verde. No okay. May meeting. Okay. Thanks All for right. coming. Thank Good you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you. Thank Great you, program. everyone, for coming. Great Their email address will be sent out tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Foz. Hey, thank you, Janet. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Demarest, Demarest, New Jersey. I'm gonna be back east. I might be close to Demarest, New Jersey. I feel like I need to go there. I don't even know where Demarest, New Jersey is. I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> so why do you want to go to Demarest, New years. Jersey? That's because it's the old church cultural center. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Um, oh, it's 
Well, actually, I'm I'm driving to Boston. It might be on my way. <laughs> so. you just take a detour. It's always on your way if you're on the other coast. Exactly. Thanks. All right. Good night, everybody. Well, I was just thinking you had to go to New York to see that foodie place that she oh, talked about. Oh, I know. About. I thought about that, too. I don't think I'll get into the city. but um, Oh, I go all that way and not go to New York take City? the train. I'll be in Boston. I'm driving to Bo I usually take the train from Philly to Boston, but this time I'm driving and I'm going to start around. The train from Boston. Boston. You, can, you, can, you, can, you can stop You can stop at Princeton Junction, park your you car, know, get in the train to Manhattan and, you know. That is actually a really good idea. I should. I have like an extra night. I mean, I was going to take two days to drive up to Boston. Just it's take the train evening. to the city and go check out that food store that sounds like it's up your alley for what you it do. is up my alley i just yeah. I, you know me i like to see food in my pot <laughs> yeah, there are of of, there. new jersey transit has a lot of uh stations uh, that kind of parallel the turnpike it'd be easy for you to and, and it's cheap it's yeah. cheap yeah. This is a really great idea. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so do you see now why I made that sort of spin-off suggestion for the next clay challenge? Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I like it. Yeah. It's perfect. It's perfect. Which if anybody's listening, it's the next clay challenge is to have our Christmas party in person and bring our pots with food in it for the potluck. So, yeah. Make make a vessel that fits the food you're serving. And then everybody should bring their own food that they're you know, their vessel they're going to eat out of. Yeah. And yep. and then you were suggesting that we have like a um, gift ex uh, drawing gift, gift exchange. exchange where you take the the serving pieces. You you win a serving piece. Yeah. yeah. And you and get the leftovers left in it. it. <laughs> you get what's left in it and that vessel. Yeah. That's great. That's a great idea. I like that That's, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't yeah. know if people are gonna pick it because of the food that's in it or because of the vessel but you know <laughs> doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> doesn't um, Myra you're here did you just get here can't hear you <laughs> all right well hey, was I the only one that kept waiting for that dog to move even though it was a virtual screen, <laughs> I kept saying, th thinking that dog has got to move. I mean, he was cocked his ear at, at Frank. <laughs> well, he was in his lap there at the end. No, well, not, not the real dog, the one in the virtual screen. He was on a, like a dog bed yeah. <laughs> and, and I kept waiting for it to move. I said, the dog's got to sit down or something. <laughs> uh. Yeah, no, when I, when I chatted with them on, on Friday, I kept looking at the dog thinking that, you know, and I, I, it was like, I knew it was a virtual screen, but I kept looking at the dog and that I did exactly the same thing today. <laughs> I didn't have to do that. Right now I'm on the old church cultural center. Interesting. Hmm. It's an art school. And we have to check out that blueberry or blackberry mountain. That's interesting too. It is. I thought, oh, what a cool thing. What a you know, great place to go. And it's outrageously expensive. Is it is it like Anderson over Mass? the top? It's like, like oh over the top. Like okay. yeah, no. I mean, I just thought, oh, well, not on not on my income. <laughs> Well, when I saw those um, sculptural installations, I thought that, yeah, there's got to be some some funding there, some money <laughs> or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, oh, wow. Well, all right. Now you guys have got me thought, thinking about Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Okay. <laughs> yeah, go to, the, go to the, the, what was it, 28? I'm, I'm going to have to listen. The YMCA, the YMCA that she talks about the 59th street i forget what 42nd street why but but okay. it was the foodie restaurant that she talked about that I well, yeah that, yeah with food and it had kitchenware mm-hmm mm -hmm. books and everything well so, and yeah. the dinnerware museum there's an online dinnerware museum 
um, that is based out of Ann Arbor, and they mm -hmm. have like monthly shows, and it's actually really interesting. You're it's, not going to Ann Arbor, are you? No, no, no. But I'm just saying they have monthly Zoom talks. Oh, got it. Got and it. I've been watching them, and it's it's really great. It's really interesting. They have a lot of really good, um, a lot of really good shop shows. So if you're ever interested in it, the Dinner Rear Museum online. Interesting. Really great. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'm going to head out. Me too. Guys, We're lucky thank people. You. Thank you very much Later. for everything. Take All care. Right, bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Yeah.